You know, I just thank God that, that, that so many great things are happening in, in, in the body of Christ, not just here, but, man, it's just where, where the anointing of God is, there's freedom. There's victory. There's people overcoming. And the Rock Church in particular, the Lord said to us that he's going to give us an opportunity to live his dream. Amen. I always tell people, you know, God's still on the front throne. Jesus is still Lord. Jody still loves me. Most of the congregation loves me. Hey, come on now. And I said, I don't know how it gets any better than that, man. He's blessing my family, my home, you know. God just continually giving us that opportunity. And so living the dream is all about seeing the blessings of God begin to manifest in your life. And so in this month, we started a series called Building Your Dream Ship. And as you can see, dream is just there because, you know, not to just be a cool little saying, but in order to live the dream that God has, we have to do things his way. We have to come before him. We have to have his wisdom. We have to understand what God expects from us. And that's what this series is all about. And so we're going to open our Bibles, as you can see, to Genesis chapter 6. And um, that's where we've been starting uh, our message for this month, building your dream ship. And, of course, the type there, we drew the type of it from uh, the uh, Noah's Ark. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as we move through it. But most of all, just to, just to uh, grab the revelation that we can do our, in our lives what Noah did in his generation. Amen? How many of you understand that the dream ship we're talking about, the ark, the type and shadow, that's why God puts type and shadow in the Bible. And so that the Bible doesn't become irrelevant. You see, the Bible becomes irrelevant when we begin to try to make the Bible fit my life. Are you listening? Then it becomes irrelevant because it just never seems to happen that way. But when I make my life relevant to him, when I put it in proper order, everybody say God is a God of order. Never forget that. God does things in order, decently and in order. He doesn't do it in such a way that it's just, you know, it just stays a mess. God begins to let us make our mess come into order. And we begin to structure our lives accordingly. And so this message has been about, about building order and understanding what God expects, just like he did for Noah. Noah had the plan. He understood why. He understood that in his day that the earth was about to change drastically. There was going to come a flood that was going to be understood as judgment. He told him the reason it was happening was because man had become destined to do things man's way. He did not care about God. It was a party atmosphere. It tells us that in Luke, as Jesus pointed out, the days are going to be like Noah in his return in that generation. And so we see how God began to organize and, and to prophesy what was going to happen. Jesus said, listen, he said, when it gets back to like it was in Noah's day and like Lot's day, that generation is going to be witnessing of my return. Now, a generation could be as much as 100 years. So you and I have one job, and that is if he doesn't come back in my time frame, then he's sure to come back soon. And so what we're doing today is not just for ourselves, but for it, it includes ourselves because he could come back at any moment. How many of you know that? But we don't know when, and so we don't focus on the wrong thing. We focus on the right thing. And that is, until he comes, I'm going to stay free from judgment because judgment, or the curse, rather, is about to get worse and worse. And it already has. How many of you have been around long enough to see that it has gotten a lot worse in the times that we've been here on this earth? Most of us came to God because things got bad. Amen? Something happened, an event took place in our lives that said, now, I don't want to play church anymore. I want a living, loving relationship with God. And I need to, know how to learn how to do that. And so order is what it's all about. We have to establish that order. Amen? And so it is that when, when the Bible talks about these things, and we look at Noah now as a type and shadow, as something that was not just an old boat that rests somewhere on Mount Ararat today, but it's a type of what we can do. Now, God said, I'm not going to ever flood the earth again. He made a covenant. The earth would not be flooded. But the next judgment on the earth would be fire. And so 
that was going to be the cleansing and renewing process. That's all going to take place somewhere way out in the future. But until then, as judgment begins to rise, Jesus said there's going to be this generation and they're going to reject me. Well, no one in their right mind would reject him. Not in church anyway. The world may, but I mean, that's to be expected in most cases. But at some point, we don't want to reject him. We want to go with him. We want to be a part of what he's doing. And so the ark was a type of Jesus. Salvation from the curse. Salvation from the danger that was coming. But it had to be established and it had to be built. Are you with me? So this is what faith does. We take the example and we begin to look at how God created this. He said, look, danger's coming. And if you want to escape that, then you're going to have to do it my way. And he said, build a boat. In the most unsuspecting place, you would build a boat in the middle of the desert. Build it out of gopher wood, acacia wood, shatim wood, all those are the same thing, where there are none. Come on now. Those things didn't grow out there in the middle of nowhere. But God said, you want to do it my way, you've got to do what I tell you to do and build it the way I say. And so we began to look at that, and we saw the types and examples of what those represent so that we can not let it become irrelevant. So it's not just a good old Bible study that, in, that just, you know, impresses us. But it's something that we can do. So while there won't be another flood of water, there's going to be, the Bible says in Revelation 12, that there's going to be an, an outpouring of the devil's wrath. How many of you understand that? So it's the same thing. It's when God says, okay, you know, man doesn't want to obey me, so I'm going to turn them over. And that's what happened. So now we have a generation that's so churched and so churchy, but yet so worldly that there's hardly any distinct difference. Come on now. You know I'm telling you the truth. They got people making decisions independent of the word of God, choosing to create the word of God the way they think it means, and it becomes irrelevant. But when it becomes relevant is when I begin to get serious about it and say, you know, Father God, I want my life to be structured and managed according to your way, according to your word. All right? And so there has to be the framework. So God had told that to Noah. Now, in verse 14 of chapter 6, God said, make thee an ark. I point that out because notice that he didn't say make you. He didn't say make me an ark. He said make you one. You're the one that needs protection. You're the one that needs to be delivered from what's coming. God told them what's coming. God has told us what's coming. Amen? You don't have to have someone prophesy that bad times are going to happen. Paul said it to Timothy. He said, in the latter days, in the last days, perilous or dangerous times are going to come. And he began to list the characteristics that we could identify. Men should be selfish, the, epi- the, the example of selfishness, heady, high-minded, haughty, prideful. They'll be lascivious. They'll give over the lust of their flesh. They'll be haters of God, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They'll be those who, dis- they, listen, they'll, they'll not obey. They'll take God's covenant, God's precious things that he designed for us to be blessed with, and they'll pervert it. Marriage, relationships. Today we're going to be talking about marriage and finances. We're going to be talking about how that our marriages can be blessed. Amen? I mean, that's, the, that's what God's will is. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's God's will for your home, marriage, and family to be blessed. Now, you've got to believe that. See, the only eight people that sailed away on USS Salvation were eight. It was Noah, his three sons, and their wives. You understand? A remnant. When times get so worldly, when there's no distinction in the church between what is worldly and what is holy, come on now, you know you're living in dangerous times. You know when we want to set the standard of holy when God set it in another place and we begin to make it fit our own, come on, we're in trouble. So I want to encourage you as your pastor. I want to encourage you if if you're a congregation member of this church, understand your best is yet to come. But we've got to make and we've got to do our part. I said, your best is yet to come. 
See, what we're wanting to do is hear from heaven and, and, and put into your heart that which is going to be required to live through the times we live in. Not just this faith that says, God, get me out of here because it's getting bad, but God, leave me here because I have built myself an ark. I have done it according to your plan, and I'm confident that I am protected by the power of God. Until I get my glorified body and go to heaven, I am instead, I am in position to get God the glory. Are you with me now? This is all it takes, and it's so simple. Now, we know that there's a lot of talk about all that stuff, about, you know, end times and everybody trying to predict. You don't have to worry about it. It's coming. Your place is, until it gets here, align your life accordingly, like God would have us to live. And so, we need to be checking out today our faith understanding there's what I, what I call theological faith versus living faith. How many of you know the difference? See, theological faith has studied the Scripture and the Bible, and they understand and they quote them. But when it comes time to really put your faith out there and say, I believe the Word of God, and I am going to stick with God and His plan, you understand that's where you find out whether you are a theological faith or living faith. Because living faith says no weapon formed against me can prosper. I don't need anybody but my God. I am confident that my God is who he said he is. Now it doesn't matter. Let me just point out. It doesn't matter what you've been through up to now. It matters what you're doing from now going forward. Amen. In Noah's day, once that first raindrop fell and that door was closed, there was no hope left. They were going to drown if they weren't on the ark. However, in our generation, there's been a lot of experience with the curse. Come on now. There's been a lot of experiences that, that are unscriptural. In other words, that, that this is not God's plan. But you know, the devil's an ultimate deceiver. He deceived a whole nation back then. And now he's got another nation, not you and I per se. But our government is saying, well, you know what? We're going to make the rules. They begin to interpret the scripture by these great theological, boy, I don't, I don't want to say anything ugly, but they're idiots. You understand, God's word doesn't change. It's still the standard, still the plan. It's still, it's, everything is just like he said. It's flowing along just like he said. And he's given us grace. You see, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. What did he do with that grace? It tells you right there, if you look up a few verses, it tells you that he found grace in the eyes of God because God is always looking to extend grace to us. How many of you understand that grace is, is free, but it's not cheap? You have to make a commitment. Are you listening? And so it says that these are the generations of Noah, that Noah was a just man. When he found grace in God's eyes, he knew that he had something that was going to be his protection against what was coming, as long as he did the right thing. And so it says he found grace. He was a just man. That means he applied grace. When you apply the grace of God, church, that's when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And at that moment, you have to begin to walk it out, all right? And it says he was perfect or complete in his generations. He never wavered. He never again, whatever happened before then, we know that once he found grace in God's eyes, he said, I'm going to follow God's way. And so, no matter what generation or culture he grew up in, he chose God. That's all you got to do. That's as simple as I can make it. Just choose God's way. Quit trying to make the Bible relevant to you and make your life relevant to him. This is what Noah did. And so, and it says he walked with God. That, those three things are all you need to do. Accept Jesus and you have found grace. Decide that you're going to change your ways according to God's plan, and you'll walk in grace with God every day. Now, grace lasted for him 120 years. That tells me as long as he was preparing himself against the curse that was coming, as long as he put forth his faith to keep building, God would never allow him to be or anyone else to be taken by the curse. But there was a whole generation that didn't believe. And we don't know everything it looked like, but we know what it had come to. 
And that's where God said, okay, that's it. So God looks for covenant. What God blesses is covenant. Now, as I begin to talk about marriage and we begin to work our way into that, understand this, God is a covenant God. What does that mean? God says, I give you all, and I expect nothing less in return. I'll tell you, we get the best end of that bargain. Because when I think the more I learn about God and realize that that belongs to me, the more I begin to get excited. Now, I still have feelings. I still have emotions. I still have eyesight that sees what's going on. But you understand, God said, I don't want you looking at all that. I want you to keep looking to me. Because I'm going to raise up a remnant generation that's going to keep the commandments of God just like Noah did. They're going to apply the blood of Jesus Christ and walk out their faith, and God is going to be with them. How many of you believe that there's no weapon formed against God? Then when I'm in him, there is no weapon. There is no cancer. There's no heart disease. There's no genetic imbalance. There's no, you know, what's coming because of what happened to so-and-so that was in your past and as part of your life. It doesn't matter. It matters what I'm doing. See, Noah found grace, and his whole family was protected. How many of you know God cares about family? All right. We're talking about that today. So all that I have is thine is the key phrase for understanding covenant. Not part of what I have, all. And I have nothing more to offer to God but my life. Amen? Now, then it's up to me to begin to build properly my Christian life, my life in God. And so it really living by, by faith and living by covenant is really simple. It's working out your salvation. Building your dreamship is what I call it for this message anyway. Now, let me say this before we turn to our first outline here. In fact, you can go ahead and bring that up, Carly, my first slide. But listen to me for a moment. How many of you understand your life in God begins spiritually? Right? So that's something unfamiliar to us. When, when, until we are exposed to why things happen and understand it properly, who's doing what? All right? Who is still stealing, killing, and destroying versus who is blessing? Who is producing life and who is producing death? I, all I got to do is keep it simple, amen? There's only two choices. So my first introduction is to learn to live my life spiritually. And so we have, as, as human beings, we are created by God with three things. We have a spirit, a soul, and a body. Now listen to me real quick. That's where everything begins. That's where I need to understand how to make my marriage better, how to make my, my stewardship in God better. That's how I learn to, to manage my life according to God's plan. Are you with me? You understand? I have to learn the spiritual aspect first. I have to have a spiritual identity with God. Now, when a person gets born again, is anybody in here born again? Come on now. Not a shame. I'm born again and proud of it because I've accepted I'm a just person. I'm a just man. If you're a woman, you're a just woman. Then all you got to do is just begin to align your life with God's plan. So first happen is spiritually. Now, what happens when a person gets born again? Listen, this is just good, solid, foundational theology. When they get born again, your spirit man, now listen, is created in the image of God. Your spirit man, born again, is created in the image of God. So therefore, when you are created in the image of God in your spirit man, your spirit cannot get sick. Come on now. It cannot suffer torment. You understand? Because it's, a, it's, it's of God. It's one with God. Are you with me now? So spiritually, if you're born again, you need to understand my faith now is not in what my eyes see, my ears hear, my body feels, my finances look like. Now I start in the right place. I am born again, and I need to learn how to, how to trust God's word. God's word cannot get sick. We saw that in Jesus Christ, right? Never was he sick. Never was he caught behind, never was he struggling. He had some challenges, but never a struggle. Come on, y'all with me now. So that's your order is I, I, I am created, my spirit man is created in the image of God, and it cannot get sick. It cannot be demonized. Come on now. 
You cannot. Unless I give it over in my will, I say, well, you know what? All that stuff doesn't matter anymore, and I just throw it all away. That can't happen. But when you get born again, that's the order. You are, you are created in the image of God. Now you have a soul. Now, your soul is subject to sickness and disease because it's your mind, your emotions, and your will. Now, what does that mean? How many of you understand that there are people that have mental illness? That's soul. There are people that have, they have their own ideas about how they're intelligent. See, that's your intelligence, your, your, your processing center for the natural. Is you learn mentally, logic, and reason. You learn one plus one is two. You learn all that, right? And so what I'm teaching you this morning, I'm doing more teaching than anything because this is so important because this is kind of a transitional day. And so you have to understand your soul is subject now. Your spirit man's created the image of God, but the Bible says you must renew your soul. You must manage the way you think. You must manage how you think. You must manage how your emotions are responding to things. You must make right choices. Mind, emotions, will. That's the soul. Your soul can be subject and demonized with lies. Come on now. You can accept untruth and believe it to be true, but it doesn't make it true just because you believe it is. If it doesn't align itself with the foundation of God's word, it's not true. Pretty simple. Your soul can be sick. It can be diseased. Are you with me now? And, and yet, if your spirit man is born again, you can strengthen your spirit man to where you overcome the soulical process. I told him on Wednesday night, and we're going to get to marriage in a moment. I told him on Wednesday night, I remember ministering to a man who had cancer. And this man had gotten to the place where he was all, he, he, his soul, he, was, he was under the influence of morphine. He had gotten into hospice. We administered the word of God for seven months. Almost day to day without fail. Now watch. This is a great example of what I'm talking about, spirit and soul. And this man, if you were here Wednesday night, you've already heard it, so I'm, I'm going to kind of just get the highlights. This man had gotten to the place where he was on morphine to numb the pain. How many of you know that morphine doesn't run the pain out? It just numbs it. Because when the morphine effect wears off, the pain is still there. Are you with me now? And so you didn't do anything to get healing or anything else. You just numbed your soul. To where it, your feeling center is, is now, you know, just masking so you can rest your, your soul. That's all it does. And your body responds. Now, this man, I went into his house. He was close to the point of death. And I went to his house and I said, I said, brother, I said, let me ask you this. Are you saved? And he said, he, he said yeah. I said, how do you know? He said, well. Because I've been in church. I'm, I know. I mean, I know. I said, well, that doesn't answer my question. I don't know that you're saved. When I said that as his pastor, he goes, well, you know, now all of a sudden he, he's, he's trying to get down in his spirit. You understand? He, he, his spirit now is, is, is being challenged, his faith. And I said, brother, I said, you know, how do you know if you're saved or not? He said, well, pastor, I mean, because uh, I, was, I, was, I was in a place and, 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 and I accepted Jesus. Now, you understand, I'm, telling, I'm showing you without exaggeration how his morphine stupor was now being challenged with his faith. <laughs> and I said, I said, brother, I said, none of that means anything to me. I know a lot of people. I know evangelists that are preaching the gospel that need to get saved. They're doing it for money. That doesn't mean you're saved. How do you know if you're saved? I want you to tell me, how do you know you're saved? And all of a sudden, he said, well, because I've led people to Jesus. I said, that don't mean nothing. A lot of religious people want to proselyte to get people into their religion. Come on now. And so he is wide awake now. You have to understand, he went from morphine's effect to now wide awake. And he's looking at me, and he's across the living room. And I said, sir, I'm just asking you, how do you know? You need proof that you're saved. And he said, well, pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Well, he started getting belligerent. And the Holy Ghost said, ask him what that is laying in his lap. I said, what does that book right there say about it, brother? He had a Bible sitting there. Now, you understand, his soul is now under the influence of his spirit, man. 
He said, big old grin comes across his face and he goes, because God said, if I confess Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, apply the blood, he said, and, and, and witness that with the confession of my mouth and I'm saved. I said, there you go. Now you prove something to me. I said, but the problem is that same book says in the same moment he took your sickness. Which is affecting your body. And I said, the problem is you were willing to stand your ground and fight for your understanding. I know I'm saved. And I said, but I could talk you out of your healing in about 30 seconds with a lot of religious rhetoric. We just don't understand why God does it. You understand? Do you understand what I'm telling you right now? His spirit man came alive and his soul was no longer under the influence of medication or anything else. But let me tell you what happened. When I left out, by the witness of his family, they said, man, you wasn't out of the driveway and he was back in that stupor. You understand? Your soul can be affected adversely by a lot of things. But your spirit, man, is created in the image of God. That's where you need to live. And when your soul begins to be affli- afflicted by something, then you have the right as a believer to enforce the word of God through your faith. That's when you're building the ark. Now, the ark is a type of Christ and salvation. The order is the key to applying this. It's got to be framed. Your life has to be framed with the word of God. You have to apply grace to receive and convert to God's way of doing things in his word. You have to apply to your life this grace and God's word. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of yourself. All right? I begin to manage my life in this order. And pitched, remember, means the covenant is established. I am I am enforcing the blood of Jesus Christ so that the word of God can manage my life and blessing is the outcome and then have confidence with boldness now let me show you so you can walk through this with me bring up 11 uh, Hebrews 11 your body also can be afflicted and affected even though you're a Christian your spirit born again You have to begin to work on your way you think, the way you respond emotionally to things. How many of you understand if you're married, how many of you understand that's a big deal? Come on now. Emotions are a large part. (laughs) She didn't hurt you, did she? She kept giving that. (laughs) Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, you understand that faith comes from something else, and that is hope. And the word hope in Greek means expectation. And and faith is the evidence of things not seen. So my spirit man has the ability to read the word, and even though I don't see it yet, I begin to now say, this is what I'm going to do to manage my life and build my ark. To establish salvation. I'm going to live by the word of God, not by what I see, not by what I hear, not by what I smell, taste, touch, senses, and all that, right? You see that. That's how faith must begin to orderly present my life to God. Verse 2, by it, faith, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Now, let me ask you this. What is a good report to you? When the natural is now, I believe God, I prayed, and I got a good report. I want to give my testimony. That's not what this means. The good report is when I get the word of God in my spirit, and I begin to see myself as God said. And no weapon, and no devil, and no demon, and no sickness, and no disease has a right to come against my body. I said I was going to teach. I'm sorry. I'm getting a little out. But you understand, my good report is the word of God. That's my good report, not the change in my circumstances, not the difference in what I felt yesterday and today. All of that is solical. All of that will confuse you and cause you to go in a direction that God doesn't need you to go in. The good report starts when my faith adheres to the word of God and that word creates an expectation and that's all the evidence I need. Now, this is true faith. Somebody getting it to verse 3. Through faith. So now I understand through faith, not what I see, 
Not what I feel, not what my soul says. I'm born again, created in the image of God, and now my soul has to be reconfigured and retrained. I can't go by Google. I can't go by what man says scientifically. I have to know that God's word is the final say in authority over my life. Through faith, I understand that everything, the world, everything was framed. Everybody say order. The way things came into being was in order. God said, let there be, and there was. Come on now. God said, I'm going to put a dividing line between the spirit and the natural, and it was. There was a distinct difference there. And so we know that the world, everything, if I say everything, was framed with God's word. Just like Noah's ark. You had to have the framework before you applied the wood, the boards. Same way we do it in our life. We use that as an example. And when, when judgment comes and the curse begins to rise and get more effective as a church, I don't know about other churches, but this church, we want to be responsible and show you this is not just some philosophical, this is God's word. My life must be framed with the word of God, with Jesus, so that the things that are seen were not made of things which do appear. I tell people, if you have something going on in your life, whether it's physical, mental, or whatever, depression, anxiety, worry, all that stuff is solical. If I'm not strong enough in my spirit, man, then you're going to look like that gentleman that I described earlier. You're going to get... And if you want to go that route, nobody's going to complain. Just stay saved. And when you die, you'll go to heaven. Amen? But you understand, I don't want to die at the hands of the devil's curse. I want to die when God says, okay, son, you have fulfilled my plan and purpose for your life. Now, come on home. Now, wouldn't that be a great getting up morning for you? Wouldn't that be the way you want to go out instead of having to, to what my eyes have seen? Good people, wonderful people. You understand, things that are seen by faith, when you see it by faith, he said, you have to understand everything your eyes see was not made by the things that appear. Now, when this was written, they didn't have computers and all the stuff we have nowadays. So I say it real simply. If the doctor looks at an x-ray and he finds that there's a mass, how did that mass get there? As a believer, if you don't know the answer to that, you're going to struggle. But the things that appear are not made by that which appears. In other words, it came from another source. If it affected your body... It didn't affect your spirit. And all you need to do is real simply, in Jesus' name. Come on now. Because that has appeared out of nowhere, supposedly, but the where that it came from was demonic activity and the curse. And God didn't create you for that. That's just an example. But your soul is going to be challenged in that moment. And how you believe is going to affect even your body. The world is not looking at the spiritual part of our life. They're looking at the physical. How do we live? Noah was under the scrutiny of a generation that was watching every move, and the longer he spent building that boat, the more crazy they thought he was. I'm not intimidated when people say, well, you're one of those radical fanaticals. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible is not literal, not to you, because it hadn't worked for you. You've been in religion all your life. You need to get saved. (laughs) You understand, I'm not trying to be judgmental or harsh, but God's word needs to be the standard for our lives so that I can create my life around the word of God that he's already created it and to do everything in order. So do you see the order? Now let's look at marriage. Bring up Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11. I'm just going to spend a little time on this. And then we'll close out with stewardship if we can get to it. Now, this is a very strange scripture for marriage, isn't it? But it's not whenever I explain it to you the way that it was originally written in Hebrew language. It says, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, 
spreads abroad, it says here, her wings, and taketh her young, and beareth them on her wings. So we see four different descriptions about the feminine expression of this eagle. However, in the Hebrew, two of them are masculine. A description, do you see family, you see a feminine part, a masculine part where it says spreadeth abroad his wings. Now this is the literal interpretation, translation rather. And taketh them, he taketh them, the young, and beareth them on his wings. And under his wings shalt thou trust. An eagle was always an example in scripture of deity, all right, and deity at work. And we're seeing God's plan here of a home. We have a man, a wife. I want to emphasize that. A man and a woman, wife. A man and a wife. I just want to say it again because there may be, this may go out over YouTube and somebody may look at it. I want them to know without any uncertain understanding that we believe God's plan is a man and a woman are all that God will honor in a marriage. I don't care what the government said and I don't care who said it. What I believe is what God said is that man and woman. And you see that in this verse. One verse. God describes the role of the woman and the man. And children, notice that she stirs up her nest and flutters over her children. Do you understand? God tenderly looks at your life and he cares about you. You understand? I mean, being in a marriage now for 32 years and having children born into that marriage, you understand? I know the difference in the way she thinks and the way I think concerning the kids. <clears throat> he spreads abroad his wings. The masculine. And carries them. He takes up them little chicks. And he carries them on the strength of his wings. Do you understand? Jesus used these analogies himself. When you're talking about a marriage, there needs to be an understanding of what I'm supposed to do and what she's supposed to do. So because God has set things in order. And so... We, we bring into something, this marriage, we bring in now others, children. I watched a documentary one day on History Channel. I like History Channel. And this documentary was a documentary that watched the lives of an eagle. And this eagle had built its nest. They put one of those time-lapse cameras up there focused on the nest. And you would see the functionality of how these two work in conjunction with one another. And that mama was steady. I mean, she would, she would put the little chicks on the side, and she's fluffing that nest up. She's making a home. She's making a home. <laughs> she wants things to be just right. You understand? I come home. I get me a glass of orange juice. I drink my glass of orange juice. I set my glass down because I'm not finished yet. The eagle comes along, and my glass is gone. <laughs> I go, what? Where's, what happened to my glass? Well, I cleaned it. I'm like, I wasn't finished with it. Well, get another glass. I'm like, <laughs> see, to me, that doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, I lived as a bachelor for a long time. I knew where everything was. My house looked like, like Gary's office. You understand? <laughs> But I knew where everything was. Brother, do you know where everything is? Now, I walk in his office. If he told me to go find something, I'd have to call God and say, God, I don't know what I'm doing here. Because <laughs> men look at it different. I knew where everything was. When, if I'm going to wear my pants again the next day, because, you know, they didn't need to be washed. <laughs> Bachelor days. <laughs> you understand? When I got married, everything, I had to go find everything. Because she was making a nest. And boy, them children. Come on now. Man, mama over them children. You understand? I mean, every, I'm talking about, you know, fix the hair right before they go to school. I used to go to school, and I'd smell coffee in the morning. I'd be sitting at my desk, and I didn't drink coffee. And I'd smell coffee. I'm like, they brewing coffee? And then I realized my mama, the last thing she would do is make sure every hair was in place. And she'd look up. 
And I'd be sitting in my desk, and I'd be going, I like coffee. Then one day I realized, I said, Mom, quit! <laughs> everything, going out the door, everything. God, got to make sure that's Mama, man. Those young boys just fluttering over them always. You know, not that dads don't care about them. In this documentary, that's what was happening, the female eagle, and there, there's no dad. And all of a sudden, this, this, this eagle out of nowhere would come into the scene of this camera, and boy, he just... And then the chick's like, whoa. You could just feel their, oh, daddy's home. Strength. I feel covered. Homes, when they get out of order in God's plan, you understand it doesn't look like this. It falls apart. There's no ark. And so he would spread abroad those wings, and those little chicks were just looking. And I remember in the documentary, at, as time went on, he would take them little chicks. Now they got little feathers on them, and, and boy, they ain't never flown before, but he would take that little chick, and he'd put it, and he would just, he'd carry it out there, and, and mama sitting there, you could just say, Mama Eagle. And boy, he'd drop, yeah, he dropped that little chick, that little thing, got one wing as far as you could see, and he'd just spin it out of control, but daddy would come right back up to the nest with it. He take the next one. I remember when I was going to teach my kids to drive. Oh, yeah. Mama's like, oh, ah! they're not old enough to drive. I said, it's okay. We're gonna, I'm, I want to I wanna give them a head start. I'm, I'm going to drive in the parking lot. No, I don't want them to drive. Like, you understand? Daddy's like, no, it's okay. You understand? Daddy has that sense that mama just got to learn to trust. But if he's not a man of God, she's never going to trust him. Bring up Ephesians chapter 5 for me. Starting in verse 20. Look at a marriage model here. Look at a marriage. Giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to the next verse. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Everybody say order. Now that doesn't mean she's his, he's her master. They're a team. They trust in one another's God-given attribute. And when you're born again, that's in you. It's there. Okay. But your soul. <laughs> as Christ is head of the church and the Savior of the body. Verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Even as the example of Christ who loved the church and when the church was reprobate, discombobulated, out of touch, out of sync, yet he loved his church. And he was patient and he was kind. Come on now. And he was bestowing the attributes of what a Christian should in the home. Next verse. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water. Do you understand, Dad, how, aw how awesome your words are in your home? When you come home with some godly words, with some encouraging words, your family is going to have rest and peace. If you're in turmoil, your home is going to be in turmoil. If you had, we cleanse. The husband can take the word and the word of God and make an altar in his home and the home become an orderly fashion. One more verse. That he might present it to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God wants the home to be a holy place without blemish. When it is, there's no curse coming nigh your dwelling. Are you with me now? Simple. Wives, the highest expression of love is to submit. When you submit your life to Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, when you submit your life, man or woman, then you're saying, Lord, I trust you with my now and future and my past. Now, a woman is going to respond to a husband that loves her that way. Patient, kind. Come on now. A caring. She'll trust his strength. Not his craziness. <laughs> Women, y'all missed a good point right there to say amen. <laughs> Instead, if you've been in a marriage. Now, now, let me say this before we do stewardship and wrap it up. If you're not married, young ladies, what you need to do is understand, prepare to be a wife. 
What does that mean? Learn how to cook. And I want God to bless me, but, you know, we're going to live on beanie weenie and, and we're going to live, on, you know, on fried green beans and some kind of tuna fish. You understand? Listen, you understand? God wants us to prepare. Husbands, if you're a young man, you're not married, are you preparing yourself to be a husband? Huh? Do you understand scripturally when the, the, that when the husband came to the father of the bride and he said, hey, I would like to make a covenant with you, and this is going to be next week when we do the ten virgins, I would like to make a covenant with you to marry your daughter. He said, fine. The daughter is all, oh, I can't wait. A betrothal was made, and I'll explain more of that next week. And that betrothal was what we call an engagement. And the dad said, now go out and bring back a dowry. Bring me back a title deed that says you have a place for my daughter to live. Come on now. Bring back some witness. How many cows do you have? How, much, how many oxen do you have? How many, come on now, sheep do you have? How, what is your dowry? Show me what you have gotten to say that I can trust you with my daughter. Do you think that the Father God can trust us with Jesus, the groom? Come on, church. He's the example. He's the example of love. He's the example of submission. He's the example of the Father. He's the example of being able to take care of us. Yet we treat him like he's not able. We got to renew our mind. We got to get rid of all this idealism that says, you know, I'm going to take the word of God and I'm going to manipulate God. It doesn't matter how I'm living. You know what? God knows. I mean, he knows that I can't live right. He knows all that. And so I'm just going to live any old way. And we just, everything falls apart. Look at your neighbor and tell him, build your ark. See, God creates an order. When you tell in marriage counseling, you look at that young man and you tell him, you know, wives, submit to your husband. He thinks me, Tarzan, she's Jane. He thinks I'm the master. No, Jesus is the master. So if, if you're single and you want to be married, start working on your being married life. Understand, that bride had something that she was doing while he was out creating a dowry. She was learning how to be a wife. Come on now. That's what God expects. That creates peace and holiness in the home and a solid marriage. And the church has failed miserably in that respect. But you know what? Everybody say, past is the past. You understand, I can start today. In Noah's day, once the rain started falling and the door was closed, honey, it was over. But you and I have such grace and such love of God that he wants us to get it right. And we got to start doing it in order. Amen? Now, last but not least, bring up the last verse of Scripture I gave you. See, stewardship is essential. Covenant is absolute. A steward is going to manage someone else's goods. We think stewardship is managing our goods to please God. But true stewardship is taking responsibility over what belongs to someone else. You understand? That's what a steward does. Not micromanaging my stuff, but getting on board with God, and God gives us wisdom. And Jesus teaching here, he called to him and said unto this man, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship. Everybody say stewardship. For thou mayest no longer be a steward. He said, listen, you're not taking care of my stuff. Now, you need to understand this in your financial life. This is all connected. I told you we're going to build the ark in every aspect that's important in our lives, and finances are a big deal. But we have the responsibility of being stewards. Next verse. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For the Lord takes away from me thy, my stewardship. I cannot dig and to beg I'm ashamed. He said, listen, I don't want to change my life. I want the blessings of the master. How many of you want the blessings of Jesus, of God? Then you understand stewardship is essential. Next verse. So he said, I'm resolved what to do. 
that when I am put out of the stewardship that they may receive me into their houses. So he said, listen, this is what I'm going to do. And if you read the story, and I don't want to read all the verses, but if you read the story, he went and he began to now say, look, how much do you owe my Lord? And he said, so much. And he said, well, write so much. You understand? Do you understand you can get back in stewardship at any time? Now, what are we talking about here? Because of time, let's move to the next verse that I have for you, Carly. He that is faithful in the least is faithful also in much. You start out small. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust in much. In other words, you can't be trusted with more because you're not trusted with what's little. Go ahead. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, everybody say money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? When I got this revelation, I understood, you can stay there, that's good, what true riches were. You understand, the true riches are the riches that God blesses with. You understand, it's, it's not about toiling and laboring and trying to steal from the world. It's about getting in the kingdom, not living with one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world, but understanding the order of God, how things work. He said, if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Hmm. Did anybody see anything powerful in this message? Well, where does our stewardship begin? You understand the smallest part, the tithe. The offering, the tithe God said belongs to me. And he said, and I claim the offering because that's the seed for the next harvest. And both of them in Malachi were mentioned as part of our stewardship. God said, you've robbed me in tithe and offering. Therefore, you're cursed with a curse. Well, so he mentioned a curse. What's a curse? It steals, kills, and destroys. It's not of God. So what do you mean I'm robbing God? Am I like a bank robber that walked into a bank with a mask on and held up the bank? No, he said, you're robbing me of blessing you. Because you're not doing the least little thing. True riches are when God blesses your life. It says in Proverbs, it is the Lord that maketh thee rich and he has no sorrow with it. You understand the word sorrow in the Hebrew? It's a definition that, that means, if you still looked it up, the definition, it means no toiling or striving. That's true riches. Where you can sleep at night. Well, you don't have to go by what you see and all that because you're a good steward. You're taking care of what God belongs, what belongs to God. He said, he said listen, it's mine. How many of you understand God knows what's his? And the church, if they ever get this revelation, it will not have to be some manipulating preacher coming up there telling you you got to give and if you want to get something like you're buying something from God. You understand it's stewardship. If we could understand stewardship and taking care of what belongs to God, he says, then I'll give you more. That's all I got to do. But, oh, we got all this doctrine. Well, you know, you know, that's of the law. Well, that's a, No, it's not of the law. Abraham tied to Melchizedek long before Moses established the law. It's a principle of living for God. And yet we strain at a gnat to swallow a camel. You understand? God says, listen, just get the smallest things done and the rest of it goes away. We don't understand, man. I mean, they got, man, I, I, got, I got a lot of month left over at the end of the money and everything. Well, you need to start somewhere. To show God that, man, I'm going to be a steward. I'm going to honor you, Father God. I'm going to honor you with what I've earned on this earth so that it becomes part of your kingdom. If you've not been faithful in that which is God's, then how do you expect God to give you something that you can enjoy? Come on up, praise team. Stewardship is not earning. It's caring for what belongs to somebody else. And in covenant... All. You want to start being a steward, not just over your money, but over your marriage, over your family. Come on, over your goods, of things you order. Y'all laugh at me. I mean, I I'm thinking, I've told you about one of the things when I learned this principle. I said, I do everything that way. At least I can think of, everything I can think of. House of God, everything. I mean, you understand, with a congregation the size that we have here, man, <laughs> I can't tell you the potential that we have, but your best is yet to come.
Because working right now in that unseen realm is darkness trying to just take over our nation. But I'm here to tell you that I don't think darkness can overtake my God. Come on, stand up on your feet. I'm here to tell you that God just says, if you'll honor me in stewardship with the first fruits, don't try to figure it out with a calculator. 10% 10% is easy to figure out of any number. People are like, well, do I tithe off the growth net? Well, you do whatever you want to do, but I'm going to tell you, what you tithe off of is what God sanctifies. That's what belongs to God. Not after the government. See, nobody gets it first. Well, I ain't got no choice. I understand that. But God, you have a choice to do it my way. For my marriage, come on now. I'm going to be a good steward. Why? Because this woman right here that's been married to me, by the grace of God, for sure, for 32 years, she has, she has, has overcome <laughs> my crazy years. And I might still have some left. I don't know, but not mentally anyway. <laughs> but you understand, she belongs to God. When I keep that in perspective... I don't treat her like my wife. I treat her like God's daughter. It's pretty simple, isn't it? You put God in covenant first. Now, you understand, we have a lot of failures in our generation concerning marriage and finances. I want everybody to look back over your left shoulder just as far as you can. Just look back. Just look back at the back of the building back there. Take a good long look. Now turn back around this way. Look over your right shoulder the same way. Some of you are going to have to help somebody. See some people looking over one shoulder the other. Now look back. That's the last time you need to look back. You understand? I don't care what's happened in the past. You understand, church? God's got a destiny for you and a plan for you in this generation. That he doesn't want you living in the past. He wants you living in what's ahead of you. And his best is yet to come for you and I. And living the dream this year, what you're doing now is setting up for your future. Amen? If you can receive what's being preached right now, we're not candy coating it. We're not sugar coating it. We're not, you understand, we're not taking some little Bible college outline. We're, what we're doing is saying this is what God is asking us to do so that he can bless your life. Amen. Submitting my spirit, my soul, my body, my marriage, my home, my family under his covering of anointing. And next week, we're going to talk about the last one, and that's our servanthood. Amen. How many of you know God is good? Come on now, don't give him a hand clap like an applause. Let's give him some praise and worship. God's best is yet to come in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God has already got your future blessed, exceeding abundantly above all your wildest imagination could ever fathom. Amen? God is so good all the time. Listen, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, and when we dismiss everybody, Jody and I will stand right here, and we will minister to you one-on-one. That's what you are missing out on. And listen, I'm telling you, He loves you, He cares about you, and He wants to see your life an example to the world of who He is. Amen? We're going to build our ark by submitting to His Word and framing our lives accordingly. God is good.